that, you know, maybe if the first few checks took a month and a half to close, the last one took 30 minutes to close. You know? Welcome to Fundraising Demystified, the podcast where we uncover the untold stories of successful founders who have raised venture capital to bring their visions to life. Join me, Jason Kirby, your host, as we dive into the hidden truths of the fundraising game. We'll explore different strategies, tactics, lessons learned from these entrepreneurs who have figured out how to win the fundraising game in their own way. Whether you're a budding entrepreneur, just getting started, or an established founder looking to scale your business, this podcast equips you with the knowledge and inspiration to conquer the fundraising landscape. Welcome to episode three of Fundraising Demystified. Today we have Rommel Verma on the show with us, and this is a unique story. We're talking about a father and son founding story that's raised venture capital, something you don't hear about often. And we're gonna talk about how they successfully closed a two and a half million dollar seed round against all odds after the crypto market had begun to collapse. And we talk about how they raised solely off warm intros, what that experience was like building a company with your father and why they decided to delay their fundraise announcement and the strategic decisions around that and many more tips. So I'm excited to be able to share this story with you. Let's go ahead and get started. Hey everyone, this is Jason Kirby here. Excited to be hosting. Rommel is joining us from OutDefine. Uh, thanks for joining us, Rommel. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's nice to be on the show. Yeah, no, great to have you. And um, it would be great for you to just give the, the audience a little bit about your background and kind of what led you to, to starting OutDefine. Of course, yeah. So uh, OutDefine is my uh, second venture back startup. I'm the founder, co-founder and CEO. It's, it's funny because I'm building OutDefine with my dad, <laughs> you know, and we have like a, you know, close to a 25, 30 year work experience difference. So, you know, people usually do with their best friends, but um uh, building with my dad think of how define as a decentralized talent community uh, its own token based uh community where people can find jobs in technologies such as web3 they can uh, learn more about how to get a job in these uh, in the space and also earn tokens our own that we are launching for our users so it's a user owned community um my background starts off with uh, you know back in 2013 2014 when i was just finishing my uh undergrad at purdue i had gotten a you know scholarship there i had come from india and didn't know how to pay for school so you know purdue paid for it so went there and i was studying with my professor and he was teaching me things like elliptic curve cryptography and uh, you know helping me get into the cryptographic space from there and i was very much a theoretical computer science student and that helped me go on to do uh, my master's at Stanford, where I was doing research again on blockchain and crypto. And it's funny because, you know, in the uh, back then, you know, AI was very popular and it still is very popular because you would go to the machine learning classes and the AI classes that, you know, like Andrew Ng would run and that would have like 400 students in it. And then you go to the blockchain class and that would have like 16 students in it, you know. <laughs> So, you know, I was doing research there, starting blockchain, uh, was very interested in this space from, you know, since that period. Although after that, I did spend about four or five years at Google right out of college uh, to, yeah, you know, I was first as a software engineer on Google search for about three, four years. And then I was a product manager on Google search. And, uh, and then I went on to join, you know, but, you know, uh, after that, went on to create uh, Equi and co-found Equi. It was an alternative investing startup that helped people invest outside of stocks and bonds. Uh, so, you know, teamed up with three co-founders and we did that. And it was in that area, you know, where you could raise uh, uh, back in 2020, 2021. And we, I did that as a CTO and I took it to about $100 million in assets under management in less than a year. And then... You know, I was always passionate about crypto. And like I said, my uh, my father was also wanted to, you know, always had a life standing dream to, you know, build this company. He came from the HR tech space. So we spent about like, you know, about two, three years just talking together and him running a company uh, and the iterating and us pivoting both us, you know, first time, second time founders. And then uh, we came together, we built out Define to what it is today. And then we went on to raise our first round of funding uh, back in 2022. 
That's an incredible story. So you kind of come to the U.S. as an immigrant, go to your know, top Ivy League schools, have an incredible you know, opportunity there, and then you know get to work for Google and go on to create what looks to be a successful company that went out and raised money and uh, has hit some you know amazing milestones, but then kind of taken the opportunity to, to start a company with your dad. That's, that's, a, that's a story that most people don't hear very often. I couldn't imagine starting a company with my father. You know, great, love him, but, you know, couldn't imagine being side by side <laughs> with him. Um, you know, so kind of, you know, tell me a little bit more about kind of why you left Equi to, to kind of start um, out to find. Yeah, I think uh, it was really at an inflection point for me also, where, you know, the, uh, the company that, you know, my father was running also, and, you know, uh, I wanted to get into the blockchain and the crypto space. And, you know, there was a place where that company was also, you know, almost it was doing OK, but it was almost running as a, you know, like a talent services business at that point. And we wanted to do something that was a lot more impactful for users. And uh, so, you know, not like taking a solution and like, you know, trying to see what that is, but trying to see what the problems are out there, you know. Uh, with uh, how remote work was quite inequitable for a lot of users. And, you know, it was just a stark contrast where, you know, the passion that you have for solving a problem, like at a place where you're helping like billionaires get richer, <laughs> you know, you have like a uh, few hundred customers and you're helping them, you know, make a lot of money to like helping like, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users actually get their jobs and actually earn money. So that kind of like an impact that you could create uh, was a big thing and, you know, that's like the true ethos of crypto also that you can help really, you know, bring forward and create a more equitable future. So that's why we started and uh, I joined with my father and then we went on to raise capital and go from there. So that was the motivation. No, that's cool. I appreciate you sharing that. And so let's talk about the raise. So uh, you guys raised about a $2.5 million seed round that you announced in December. But from what you told me, it, it sounds like you ra actually closed the round several months prior, probably kind of before the major collapse in crypto. So kind of walk us through that that timeline uh, from when you and your father kind of get started with the company and then when you guys go out to raise to when you successfully closed. Yeah, so we definitely announced in December. Um, and uh, the reason for that was because you know, we we talk to our investors and, you know, seed round is when you have a prop, certain promise and you have early traction and then you want to be able to capitalize on that and requiring us to get our product and our messaging and our token in a good place made sense for us before we actually started to put fuel to the fire. Uh, that is why we thoughtfully like held off the uh, announcement. But although, you know, in hindsight, it was the same time when FTX was collapsing. So, you know, there's not much <laughs> that can be said, you know, like one thing is that not to fight the market, you know, like not to, you know, listen to the market sentiments because it can make a big difference. But uh, uh, I started the fundraise process back in around February, March is when, you know, as a first time, uh, CEO trying to go and raise uh, capital, institutional funding. Uh, and the process itself was maybe a three to four month process. And it required like my full time effort, like for, uh, you know, three to four months of just going out, talking to maybe 80, 85 funds, uh, getting all sorts of like, you know, interesting responses and, uh, you know, having four or five of them really believe in what you're doing and once one ball starts rolling up, you know, the canonical story, you know, the others start to come in place. Like, I remember like one of our investors, we had two lead investors, Jump Crypto and TCG Crypto. So, um, uh, you know, like for some of them, it took maybe a proper month, month and a half to do due diligence, right? You know, after the first conversation, but they were all through, you know, warm introductions to different members of the community. but. You know, I remember the final, you know, half a million to a million that we were trying to raise that happened like 30 minute calls. <laughs> so that, you know, that compression of timing from starting in like, you know, February, March, all the way to June, when we actually closed around uh, the first two, three months is like, you know, you have like, you're getting like half a million of check in and then you're getting another million in, and then suddenly the rest of the round closes so quickly and like, you know, a couple of weeks, it was very, very interesting to see but i never went out with the 
uh, mindset that, you know, it is a very unambiguous process and, you know, it is a very tough one, but you need to prepare yourself for that. So, you know, it sounds like you, you started the company in, in 2022. So did you, did you build the product before you went to, to fundraise or did you kind of fundraise to get to build the product? Yeah. So the, the, we were already doing about $400,000 of transactions because my father was running the company about a year before. So it was not, uh, not necessarily that just on an idea we went down to raise, although that does happen and that could have happened if the market was back, like how it was hot in 2021, where, you know, in some of the companies that even I saw in my last one and also in others where just on an idea, people would raise like a very, you know, massive valuations and uh, raise like five, six million. Uh, you know, so that was not the case in 2022 because the markets had already started to compress since November of 2021. And, you know, things were in a tough round. Well, all the things are much tougher now, but, you know, things were still pretty tough back then. Yeah. So, so, you know, yeah. And, and so, um, okay, so you guys already had built a product that got to around 400K in, in overall transactions on the platform. So you had some, you had some traction, you had some validation. Um, you know, you mentioned that you met with about 80 VCs. Like, how did you go about getting those those meetings with those VCs? What was your strategy? Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that was very important to do is to uh, focus on getting uh, warm introductions. Like, none of the funds that we reached out to or any angels that we got connected to was, you know, as a cold outreach. Uh, so just being part of the ecosystem, especially, you know, the San Francisco ecosystem made a big difference uh, because, you know, uh, that was one of the things that uh, I noticed that, you know, when we used to work at Google, we were so much in our own world and we were so, you know, shielded from everything that's happening outside it, that, you know, creating that connect with people makes a big difference and being part of some good communities makes a big difference. Like OnDeck really helped uh, the Zoogler community, which is the ex Zoogler community, really helped. And uh, there's always, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm someone who likes to help other founders also. So, you know, when you know, I asked someone if, hey, this is what I'm doing and this is where I'm, they would always make an introduction. Uh, so, warm intros really help. But the funniest things is that, uh, you know, one of my friends would write a, you know, article about us on their newsletter and then suddenly NBC would hit them up and then, you know, they would go on to put money in the company or, you know, I'm just like meeting someone from the Zoogler community over, a, you know, over a conversation and then they would go ahead and like, you know, invest, which is funny because, you know, through that conversation, we also got an acquisition offer right before our fundraise. <laughs> so that was like, you know, just, just talking to people and the community helps you out and they make intros and suddenly you have like a term sheet and you're like, that's that's pretty incredible. So warm intros really work, but but it's easier said than done, and that's always a process, and it's not a snapshot like one one time. In uh, yeah. And so with the with the warm intros, did you ever find yourself being in the room with the wrong person? Like you took a warm intro, someone said, "Hey, you got to talk to this person." You get in the meeting, and you're like, both of you are like, "This was a total waste of time." Um, not so much so because, you know, I think generally you don't know how different funds are thinking about them, but, you know, about you. But uh, when I used to do my research, I would kind of get a sense of why uh, someone would want to talk to you. And uh, the only, the, I, there were a couple of funds who reached out to us directly on LinkedIn, and then you they took a lot of interest, but only at the end, they did not invest. Uh, and not just they're not invest, you know, they would go radio silent. And then you can get a sense that, you know, they're probably here just to uh, gather information for their company. So, you know, we had a lot of conversations of so just doing our homework on every fund and being very realistic of what you can do. Like if there's a you know top tier fund, but you see there are competitors might not be worthwhile to talk with them just because, you know, it's about feeding uh, information. It's really about finding the ones who believe in you and like some of them. Uh, would and some would not. So uh, you would, in, in the conversation, it would be very nice, but later on, either they would go radio silent or they would be like, hey, no, we invested in someone else. That's similar to you. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's part of the process. You know, there's no, no hard feelings, you know? No, and I, I agree. And it's, it's one of those things where it's, you know, a lot of founders are concerned about meeting VCs and they'll kind of like take their information, share with a competitor and, and whatnot. But it sounds like 
you know, you still put yourself out there, put, you know, kind of put the best foot forward and focus on feces that had high conviction in you and what you were building. Um, and you know, the radio silence thing, you know, I, it's a nice way to put it, but in a lot of you know ways I see it is like you get ghosted, you know, they, you know, take a bunch of information, you're excited, you're like, oh, great, this could go somewhere. And then they just cold, nothing. You're just like, you spent all that time with me and nothing. You can't give me a response. Um, so I you know, pre- appreciate you sharing that. And so, um, you, know, you had mentioned that you'd ra- you started the raise in February, you had a bunch of meetings and then when it came to that close, yeah, I guess, when did you get your, your first term sheet? And I guess, how many term sheets did you, did you get for the round? Yeah, since it was a seed round and we went on a safe, um, safe note, but it's also safe for the token warrant, which I'm happy to talk about because it's, you know, we are also building our own crypto token and, you know, the, uh, investors are particularly interested in like, you know, purchasing the token also, right? So so this is a slightly a different uh, instrument, but uh, and the way it happened is I think, uh, you know, uh, there were two, three different funds. And, and the good thing I wanted to share with you, Jason, is that, you know, I had two very mature people who were supporting me through the fundraise process, just because it is a very difficult uh, journey in general. It's a very ambiguous one, but, you know, because uh, my co-founder has a lot of experience navigating, like I said, he's my father. He has done a lot of companies. He took like an engineering services company public to maybe two, two and a half billion and, uh, you know, public listing as a key member and leader. And then, you know, one of my board members whom we have also has, you know, ran companies, venture backed, Sequoia backed, uh, and, you know, has exited maybe three, four times. So having their guidance throughout the process was very, um, very, very important so that we knew exactly, uh, you know, how to approach things. So you could start to get sense when someone would be pulling back or someone is taking interest to take another call. So uh, Jump Crypto was our first investor. And, you know, they, uh, you know, we connected with them through, someone writing about us on the newsletter and then, you know, someone in their fund reading it and then sending it to someone else and then, you know, having a call which moved two, three times and then finally talked and we connected and they really just believe, you know, in what we were trying to do with helping people get like, you know, a more equitable future and having like, you know, token-based talent network. So uh, they, I think, the funny thing is, I think we closed them in a week's time, which was pretty fast, uh, but, uh but you know everyone else who was maybe thinking about it doing their due diligence doing their own independent uh research you know when we said to them hey we have this fund over here then they're like okay maybe let's talk to them and also see how they invested so there can always be a very big signaling game you know like you know once you have uh someone get through then there adds a little bit of you know pushing the pushing over the barrier right so then from there Maybe it took a week to two weeks to close with Jump Crypto. Uh, but then after that, you know, you had like TCG Crypto, which was our other lead investor. They came in with uh, another significant portion of the round. And, you know, they had been do- doing due diligence on us for a month, month and a half. Uh, one thing we did is, you know, I have seen a lot of people in the safe round space. They give multiple different valuations to different investors. So they like early ones get less and then the future ones get maybe double of what the early ones did. And because we were cognizant of what the market looks like, we did not do that because, you know, the markets were not in a place where, you know, you can do that. So even to the last investor who joined us, we gave them the same terms as the first one uh, for that round. Uh, And that just uh, goes back to my point that, you know, maybe if the first few checks took a month and a half to close, the last one took 30 minutes to close, you know, because it's a very big signaling game because then you're, making it a no-brainer for them and you're giving them what they want, right? Well, your goal is to capitalize the company so that you can actually hit, you know, milestone. Yeah. So. Uh, that's, that's, that's a valuable insight. I feel like a lot of founders, you know, getting that first big check is always the hardest hurdle to overcome. And then once you get those that first check, it's just everything gets a little bit easier because you have that validation. Everyone, no one wants to be the first check. And finding that person, yeah. that, that firm that's brave enough to kind of come in with a big check you know, can uh, help streamline the, the process. But I want to go back to something you mentioned. Uh, so you structured as a safe and, uh, you know, pretty common for, you know, pre-seed seed stage to, to go with the safe route and kind of allow people to come in when, they, uh, when they're ready. So it gives you a lot of flexibility and autonomy. Um, but you also mentioned there's a, a token warrant. So 
for those that maybe aren't familiar with how a token uh, warrant works, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, why you chose to do, offer the token warrant and kind of what the what that looked like. Yeah, so because the crypto aspect is very important to our company, because that is how we incentivize our users to be as part of our LinkedIn Core Web3 product, um, you know, where they earn tokens for being a part of the community, for contributing to it, for finding jobs, for helping others. Um, uh, so there were like two, three different ways in which you can raise, uh, you know, and uh, help, you know, sell a token in some sense, right? Uh, and uh, that has gone through a lot of like, you know, trial and error over the last, you know, since 2017 through the many great ups and downs that crypto has gone through. But what I found through talking to other founders who had raised at the same time and also evaluating with our lawyers, like what are the different options? Token warrant works out well because it gives the uh, investors an ability to uh also not just buy purchase company equity in the company but also purchase the token you know using the same capital that they are putting now the interesting thing with web3 companies is that you know some of them turn out to become DAOs in the future you don't know and some of them completely you know dissolve their cap table and they only have like one table which is their token where you know 50 percent to 60 percent is like reserved for the community and the rest is held by the company, the investors, the early team, and you know the other things that you do. So, so what it basically came down to is like you know allowing you, our investors to participate in both, and you know being very upfront that you know if this turns out into a DAO or uh, you know if it's both the equity route and also the token route, then they have participation in that. And I think that's one of the reasons why all our investors were you know Web three focused because they understood that concept versus when we talked to uh, Web2 investors or like, you know, general investors who have traditionally invested in marketplaces, they would not understand it and also not understand it. Maybe their LPs don't allow them to invest in that because they're like, we didn't pay you to go and, you know, do that, right? So it through the whole process, it was very interesting to learn like how the, you know, VC mindset is also like, you can see that now also where, you know, if a couple of funds hold back on investing, then the rest of them will wait <laughs> also. And that's something that you can also see, you know, like, or if some of them open the floodgate, then the rest will start to invest. So there's a lot of signaling game and, uh, yeah. And and so, you know, in this process, you know, your, your father was kind of working on product and getting some transactions prior to you guys going out and raising. But when you guys actually went out um, to raise, you know, it took several months to, to kind of get, get going, like, from an operation standpoint and, you know, company growth, like what happened in that timeline? Were you guys kind of like growing transactions? Were you seeing momentum? Were you like just focused on fundraising? Kind of what was that, that balance of, you know, fundraising versus execution and hitting milestones? Yeah, I think uh, it was interesting because for me, my sole thing day in and day out was fundraising and really tweaking the narrative and tweaking the story to be able to sell a vision that investors and you know, you know the team and the company is excited about what we are trying to do. Uh, the good thing about having you know a, a co-founder and especially someone you can trust and work with is that you know what your skills are. And like for my co-founder, it is very clear that you know he has very strong operational and you know revenue understanding. So you know we we just went to the in, in the mode where we were growing the number of users and we were growing the revenue that we were generating, right? And that's what uh, they were focused on. And, uh, you know, he was focused on and I was focused on the fundraise aspect. So I actually, uh, I'm actually thinking that now if I have to go out to fundraise and we have a much, much, much bigger team, like, you know, maybe three times bigger than what we were previously, how to manage that process. Uh, but, you know, that's that's something else, even, you know, the bridge comes over, to, like when you have to cross that bridge. But, but thankfully back then, uh, you know, he was able to take the burnt of that and I'm very thankful about that. So just, just kind of a fun question. Does, you know, being that you're the CEO and you were the one fundraising, like, does that make it that your dad works for you or do you guys kind of see yourselves as equal? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the... The good thing is there's a lot of like trust and respect uh, in the way we work. And it's, uh, you know, we both abdicate to where our areas of expertise and responsibilities are. Uh, if it has to do anything with 
you know, fundraise or product or marketing where I have an understanding, then we look at that. I mean, age and, you know, family status, all of that does not come into picture. If there's anything to do with like, you know, strategy and market and, and, you know, how do you execute and operate on it? I think he does really well. So I, you know, reserve judgment and we always take each other's counsel and, you know, uh, how that goes. So, so of course you have tough conversations a lot and, you know, but, it's not like this is the first time we are working together. I think we have like hired a lot of that out over the past two, two and a half years. Uh, so had to put in a lot of work in that. Good, good, good but... politically correct <laughs> answer to not upset your father. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I wanted to kind of, um, you know, we, we talked about some of the strategies that you use, getting more mentors, being a part of communities, you know, to open up doors for you. What would, um, what was something that sucked about your fundraise? What was something that was just exhausting or difficult or frustrating about your experience? Uh, I think the one thing that we, that I had to mentally prepare for, and this is something that, you know, you get more comfortable as you deal with more ambiguity is that there's no guarantee of success. Uh, and that is just something to be very comfortable with because uh, if I would have gone through the fundraise process thinking I have to set undue expectations that, hey, I have to raise this much or I have to raise this much, or, you know, then it becomes like you are playing a game against yourself, right? So uh, although that still keep kept on coming on, especially because it was my first time actually fundraising myself um, uh, versus having, you know, someone else do it in the team. And... Uh, but I felt like, you know, keeping that mindset was very important to mitigate a lot of the self-doubts and what if questions that come in mind and just focus on running. But you could see, you know, there's like from one day, two day, three days, one week, two week, three week, you're, you're doing through the process, you're going through the motions, you may not get results. And I was not getting results, right? Uh, and uh, you you get in ways, you, you keep craft, crafting the pitch because the pitch is the product that you're send, selling at some point. You know, it's uh, it's the pitch deck, it's the story, the narrative that you're give, giving that you're selling. So just getting like very comfortable with that was okay that you, you may raise zero at the end of it and it's okay because we had an acquisition offer with a term sheet, which we had to decline to go on to raise, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it's easy to give up and say like, okay, let's take this, whatever nice paycheck that's coming, uh, you know, for the, whatever transactions is coming through, let's go ahead and do that. First thing, like you have to say no, right. You can't just keep them hanging to go on to do something else. So. Yeah, no, that, that's an interesting perspective because I've seen that happen before. I've had that happen in a past company where, you know, before you go out to raise or in the middle of the raise, someone kind of throws a curveball at you and says, what if we just buy you outright? And it's, uh, you know, as a founder, it's kind of hard to say no sometimes because that could be millions of dollars in your pocket today. Um, but you're sacrificing maybe tens of millions or hundreds of millions, you know, for a far shot chance coming down the road and you sacrifice control. So it's, uh, but it gives you some fuel to go to market with. You know, if you go out and raise money, you kind of have a price. And yeah. it's often that you can probably have a much higher price for the valuation when raising capital as opposed to the acquisition price. So it, uh, it's an interesting predicament to kind of make a tough, tough decision on. Um, you know, so for <clears throat> kind of where you guys are at now, so you guys raised, you, you know, you raised back in June. You're, you know, you kind of announced in December. I, I kind of like to unpack that a little bit more as to why you delayed the announcement. There were a couple of things. One is what is right for the company at that point. And what was right for the company is to uh, revamp our product towards the token experience. It was right for the company to revamp our uh, strategy around how are we, you know, what is our vision of the company? Is it just a job marketplace? What are the issues with that? Uh, what is the competitiveness with that? How can you grow beyond it? Um, so, uh, but, and also we wanted to do it in a thoughtful way that like, you know, you don't want to get users on your platform or, you know, you get like an announcement and then there's no follow up through it. Right. So our focus entirely on the company the back then was to make sure our product is revamped to the place where we can bring it and we can actually leverage, uh, the growth or the organic traffic that we are getting, um, into, into growing the network and growing the community. So. Uh, you know, we just didn't want to like waste that opportunity and, you know, get a good high and then, um, you know, not be able to follow through on it. 
So just being a little bit thoughtful on that uh, and uh, going from there. Yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. Cause you know, in a lot of cases, you know, companies want to announce the raise as quickly as possible for acquiring talent and getting people excited about the opportunity. But in this case, it was strategic to delay because you wanted to make sure the product was in a good place to capitalize on the announcement. And so that's something for yeah. you know founders out there to think about is, you know, think about how you want to spread the message. Like one of my companies in the past, yeah. we delayed our announcement for months because we thought it would make us look bad in front of our customers. We were dealing with schools. We didn't want to come out and brag, say, Hey, we made millions you'd make have millions of dollars. And like the schools, yeah. you know, like, Oh, we're charging schools. And, uh, you know, so we delayed it for quite some time until we needed to use it as leverage to acquire talent. You know, we needed to come yeah. off as legitimate and of scale and have, you know, kind of a larger presence in the tech community in our area. So we kind of strategically launched, you know, that announcement in specific areas. So it makes perfect sense to kind of, think about, you know, not just announcing for the sake of announcing, but strategically aligning it with company objectives. Um, yeah. um, so, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So, um, you know, next question would be, you know, from a fundraising perspective, you know, you guys raised two and a half million, you know, it's been maybe a little under a year, you know, eight to, you know, uh, 10 months or so, like, what's next? So what kind of milestones are you guys looking to try to hit and, and when do you think you'll go back to market? Yeah, so uh, the good and the, the, a good thing and a bad thing is like, you know, the good thing is, you know, we run our company in a very efficient way. Like, you know, we have our independent board and, you know, my co-founder also has a lot of experience. So we haven't been running it in a way where, you know, we burn hundreds of thousands every month and you know then we are in a position like the funny joke is that no matter how much you raise everyone just has 20 months of runway <laughs> you know so so we have been a little bit more thoughtful about it uh, uh, and that gives us space and we have been hitting our milestones also and we've been growing at a pretty rapid pace in terms of the users on the network so what we're trying to do is like you know uh, help grow our community really build this linkedin for web3 and uh, you know the futuristic technologies kind of a community uh quicker have more users on it uh have you know go from like tens of thousands to users to hundreds of thousands and that's really where we want to go with and we really want to uh in this market uh fundraise from a position of strength because you know you know that the web3 uh ecosystem or the venture funding has also been dried up but that's not just isolated to web3 that's you know across the board you can see that uh like you know if you go to like security companies maybe like you know two three companies are taking up like a majority of the funding so um, for us, it makes sense to continue to hit our milestones, given that we are very decently capitalized and we are not in a position of like, you know, being stressed about, you know, running out of runway in like six to 12 months kind of thing. And, um, uh, and continue to grow our numbers. And, you know, given the markets are like this, uh, we do what, when life gives you lemons and, you know, you're like, okay, if hiring is slowing down, then how can we grow the community? Right. And we move our true north or core metric accordingly so that the two-sided or the multi-sided network continues to evolve and as hiring picks up then we continue to help those people get opportunities but it's not like you know going going with a position of strength really and you know deciding to fundraise accordingly i appreciate you sharing that and i guess uh you know for other founders out there that are going out and trying to raise their you know pre-seed seed series a you know what would be your advice to them I think um, uh, it, it depends on, you know, I, I may not be qualified to talk about beyond seed stage, you know, just because I have not raised myself, uh, but uh, uh, the seed stage in this market um, has been, you know, last year I thought was tough, but this year is also very tough. So I, um, uh, I would highly encourage, um, I, I do think that it, if, if someone needs to go out and raise capital, then it's better to do it now than later because, you know, if it continues to get worse till it gets better. Then, you know, you're always playing that game where, you know, like if I would have raised in 2021, I would have raised X amount. And if I'm raising in 2022, then I'm raising like Y, which is a percent less than X. And then 2023 is like even lesser. That's at least a trend that I am seeing uh, because now everyone's saying like, be comfortable with round rounds and things like that. 
And, you know, even talking with initial conversations with our investors, I think maybe even a flat round for us, you know, is what, you know, we have heard, right? Like, you know, if you just wanted to go with the current milestones and if you wanted to raise. So just being comfortable with not thinking so much so about valuations. I think valuations is a vanity metric and it just gets to the ego quicker. And I know everyone has, uh, you know, a lot of people have got size ego, yes. <laughs> so uh, not to think about that, but to think about the amount of capital you need to survive and, you know, making a very coherent story and strategy around it, having numbers to prove because getting that one investor who can back you and that others follow through through their introductions or through their credibility is usually how I've seen the dominoes roll. Yeah, that makes sense. And I also want to tap into some nuggets of information you shared earlier. Of you know, it sounds like you know it's it's hard to do this once you kind of get in the mode of fundraising. But you've you established a community, you've joined and participated in communities and built your network to where you know when when you came out looking to raise, you had opportunities for warm intros. And that's something that I think, you know, founders really need to look at and, you know, take into consideration, you know, before going to raise. And also you guys had traction, you know, you guys had a certain amount of volume of transactions, you know, I imagine it was growing and showing positive signs. Uh, and you were building an efficient business, uh, where I think kind of right before you guys started to raise, it was all the rage to light as much cash on fire and you know, get as many users as possible as with terrible unit economics and, you know, the world has flipped and now investors are expecting, you know, founders to be capital efficient, you know, be smart with their money, extend runways, have profitable unit economics. And so, you know, running a, a, a profitable or, you know, uh, unit economic, uh, unit economical business is kind of back in you know in style now, and that's something that founders really need to kind of pay attention to, and you know prepare for uh, going to raise when you're at a certain inflection point. Not necessarily you know everyone needs money all the time in most cases, but it's about how you can raise capital successfully and time it right with the growth of your your product and your business. Um, so. Yeah, Rama, this has been an, an amazing conversation. It's been amazing to hear your background. I, I'm so excited to to have your story and, and be able to share it because, you know, I think this will probably be one, if not the only, story where I get to have a co you know son and father co founder situation for a tech company that is raised a, a sizable seed round, which is you know awesome to hear. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you so much, Jason. It was uh, wonderful to be on the. A podcast with you so thank you so much <laughs> and uh for anyone that's uh, following us um you know what would be the best way for them to learn more about you out to find and potentially follow you um i'm happy to connect with anyone who needs help or wants to uh, uh you know like you know deconstruct the fundraise process uh, happy to please feel free to reach out to me on linkedin or twitter or on my email it should be pretty straightforward to figure out the email and um, happy to help anyone who needs help, Jason. Awesome. No, I really appreciate that. And we'll make sure to link those in the, in the podcast uh, down below. And uh, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Take care.